Okay, guys, so Dr. Ash back um, with perfusion part two. These are the disorders of perfusion. Um, so in the first video, we talked about how it's carrying oxygen to oxygen and nutrients to the tissues and cells and removing waste away from the tissues and cells. And so these disorders are going to have to do with those processes, right? It's some sort of interruption in that ability to take oxygen and nutrients to and waste away. So let's talk about atherosclerosis first. So this is a hardening, narrowing, or some sort of buildup on the walls of the artery. Could be calcium, could be plaque. Um, one of two things is gonna happen with atherosclerosis. One, there's either gonna be a rupture because the pressure gets so high that it develops like a ballooning or a weakening of the wall, which is called an aneurysm which can rupture, or it can cause a complete blockage, in which case that's no bueno, because that means we are not getting any sort of oxygen or nutrients to that area. So there are no major symptoms. There's nobody like walking around saying, oh, oh, this must be atherosclerosis because this, this, or this, right? Sometimes there is pain involved though, because again, pain at its very underlying source comes from a lack of circulation to an area. So there may be some pain involved or some people may not even know they have uh, small blockages in certain vessels. Uh, this can lead to erectile dysfunction, myocardial infarction or a heart attack, a trans ischemia attack or mini strokes, if you will. Um, and I'll go can also delay wound healing and or cause a stroke, you know, particularly if this is one of the vessels in the brain. Now, there is a strong correlation between diabetes and atherosclerosis. So patients with atherosclerosis tend to also have underlying diabetes or vice versa, however you want to look at it. We'll move on to chest pain, which some places pronounce angina and some places pronounce angina. So it just really depends on where you are in the country as to if this is angina or angina. Either way, it is chest pain and it can happen either suddenly, just randomly sitting on a couch and you get chest pain. Um, it could be when you're up and moving around, mowing the lawn, doing yard work, doing dishes, some sort of activity, um, or it can be recurrent. And so basically that means it just happens over and over again, okay? Oftentimes, uh, especially our male patients tend to say it's a very crushing pressure in their chest. Um, and again, this can be indicative that there is some sort of delayed or blocked blood flow to the heart, okay? So this is particularly your coronary arteries that feed the outside muscle of the heart. So, there's not enough blood flow. This is where the chest pain comes from if it's truly heart in nature. Now, there are other things that cause chest pain that's lung related, which is outside of the scope of this particular one. We are just talking about perfusion. And so again, there's that concept of increased oxygen demand equals pain. So there's not enough nutrients or oxygen getting to those coronary arteries. And therefore we have chest pain. That's one of the reasons why people have um, are told to rest for a few minutes to see if the chest pain goes away. Because if you are at rest, there is decreased oxygen demand in the body. And so theoretically, um, the chest pain should resolve. If it does not, then we call 911. All right, the next one is hypercholesterol. You might see this as hypercholesterolemia. You might see this as hyperlipidemia. You may have seen even both in your patient's chart and you're like, what the heck? But it's all the same thing, okay? It just depends on how it's coded. And so this is clearly defined by a high cholesterol or high triglycerides. And what we consider high for cholesterol is anything above 200. I believe it's milligrams per deciliter, but I didn't write it down. Um, and then triglycerides greater than 150. Okay, so it's defined by total cholesterol greater than 200 or triglyc triglycerides greater than 50. And so basically what happens is this cholesterol and triglycerides will circulate in the body with lipo lipoproteins. And what happens is it causes a thickening of the coronary walls, the coronary artery walls, as well as the cerebral walls. So that's why there's an increased risk of a stroke because of the cerebral or brain involvement. And that is why there's an increase 
of a myocardial infarction because of coronary or heart involvement. Typically, high cholesterol is well controlled with a combination of medications, diet, and activity. And of course, we're going to go into medications in part three because I like to keep these short, sweet, and to the point to give you what you need. All right, the hypertension or high blood pressure. This is defined by one of two things, and this is a little bit different from the American Heart Association. Technically, AHA says that anybody above 130 over 80 is considered hypertensive. However, there is some gray area because some people just kind of live around 130 over 80. So uh, of course we know that it does not fit one size fits all. We know that our patients are individualized. However, most nursing texts are gonna tell you that it is a systolic blood pressure that is consistently greater than or equal to 140 millimeters over mercury and or a diastolic blood pressure greater than or equal to 90 milligrams of mercury. So this is cause, uh, or high blood pressure causes the heart to do overload, okay? It works harder than it has to. And the heart is just like any other muscle. The harder it works, the more likely it is to wear out. So a lot of times what happens is it'll damage the endothelium of these vessels, which causes atherosclerosis. It increases workload of the heart that will typically um, or eventually lead to a heart attack and or heart failure. And the sad thing about hypertension is a lot of times it's asymptomatic. Some patients may even say, oh, I just have a slight headache or I just feel a little off or a little dizzy today, but then the next day they feel fine. So a lot of times this is the reason why hypertension is called the silent killer. Okay. There is one more thing that I just want to throw in here. I don't think that any nursing test is going to ask you, but just FYI, a lot of people have what we call white coat syndrome, which is where the blood pressure is high only at the doctor's office. Doctors historically wear white coats. So that's where the white coat syndrome comes from. So oftentimes, if you get a high blood pressure reading at your doctor, they tell you to trend it at home. Okay, the trends at home. The other thing for you to understand is that our blood pressure is lowest first thing in the morning because we are nice and relaxed after what is supposed to be a good night's sleep. All right, we'll move on into heart failure. Heart failure is an actual pumping problem. So the heart cannot pump the blood and or it cannot fill with blood the way it's supposed to. Basically, the heart can't meet the demands of the body, therefore it's considered heart failure. It is most closely associated again with that long-term hypertension. We've let this high blood pressure go on and on and on, coronary artery disease, or it can happen after a heart attack. There can be significant enough damage after a heart attack that it eventually leads to heart failure. Priority assessment with heart failure patients will always be ABCs. You always wanna assess respirations first because there is a significant amount of lung involvement regardless of which side of the heart is affected here, all right? There are actually four types of heart failure, but two major ones that get tested on, okay? So systolic heart failure is an inability of the heart to pump and diastolic heart failure is an inability for the heart to fill with blood. But the two most common that get tested on are left and right-sided heart failure. Left-sided heart failure, what happens is the left ventricle cannot pump enough blood or cannot adequately pump the blood. And so the blood will back up into the left atrium which then backs up into the pulmonary veins. And oftentimes we think of symptoms as lung. So I want you to remember left-sided heart failure has lung-related symptoms, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, um, orthopnea, which is where the patient cannot lay flat. They have to prop up on pillows in order to be able to breathe appropriately, fatigue. And then they also have this S3 heart sound, because of the fluid overload state that happens in heart failure. Remember, these patients are fluid volume overload because their heart's not pumping enough fluid so the fluid stays stagnant, can't get to the lymph system and therefore can't be processed out and or to the kidneys. Then we have the right-sided heart failure. This is where the right ventricle cannot pump the blood adequately so it backs up into the right atrium which then turns into backing up into the inferior and superior vena cavas or vena cavas again depending on which part of the country that you're in and symptoms i think left-sided lungs right-sided rest of the body so that's going to be the um 
what we call vascular congestion, peripheral edema. They've got the swelling. Um, they may have some difficulty breathing as well, which is why we always go back to a respiratory assessment as our number one priority. Next we have is venous thrombosis and we're almost done here. And a venous thrombosis, uh, DVT, you may hear it called or deep vein thrombosis, number of different ways you can say it, but it's a blockage in a vein or multiple veins related to a thrombus, which is also known as a blood clot. And I've actually shown you a picture here so you can see the difference. A lot of times my students, when they're in doing their physical assessment, they're like, I can't tell, this one might be a little warmer or this one might be a little bigger, I'm not really sure. You can see clearly the difference in the perfusion between these two legs. You can see the leg with the blue arrow is swollen, it's discolored. Look at the foot on the one with the blue arrow, right? Very discolored, uh, very different, very swollen, looks a lot different from the other leg. Um, DVT or deep vein thrombosis is most common. It's found in the lower legs. If it's not treated quickly, it can very um, quickly turn into a pulmonary emboli or embolus, which we're gonna talk about next. But symptoms, they may be asymptomatic. However, most commonly you're gonna see that pain, swelling and discoloration. And so while from this picture, you can't tell if the person's in pain or not, you can definitely see the discoloration, the swelling, the redness, that's happening in this leg. Pulmonary emboli, this is where that clot has moved into the pulmonary artery and it causes some sort of blockage into the pulmonary artery, which is bad. These symptoms are a very sudden onset of shortness of breath, sudden onset of chest pain, a dry, hacky cough. The heart may have flutters or pal palpitations. Um, and again, this is a very sudden onset. So this very much so looks like um, a patient that just got back from surgery, life is good, and then has a sudden onset of shortness of breath. That is where your brain should go, pulmonary emboli. Okay, so sudden onset of these symptoms. The last thing that we'll talk about here today is peripheral vascular disease. It can also be called peripheral artery disease. It's all about the same thing. This is where the blood vessels become narrow or they spasm or they become completely blocked, okay? And this is limited blood flow to the legs, which causes leg pain. Again, there's that lack of oxygen and nutrients being able to get to the legs. We have something very classic called claudication. Claudication happens when these PVD or PAD patients are up and walking around. Remember when we're at exercise, when we're doing things, it increases the oxygen demand of the muscles. Well, when I have limited blood flow to that area, guess what I'm gonna get? I'm gonna get pain, okay? So I want you guys to really drive home the fact that pain comes from some sort of alteration in perfusion to an area, okay? That is primarily where pain comes from. There are other sources of pain. Yes, I understand. But for perfusion reasons, for perfusion purposes, this is a lack of blood supply to the area. Now, the fun thing about claudication is, guess what? It gets better at rest, okay? Just like the heart attack or the angina and chest pain, it tends to get better when the patient is at rest. So that is your classic symptom of peripheral artery disease. And that is it for this one. Uh, in part three, we're going to talk specifically about the medications and hopefully that will clear up, um, clear up, clarify any questions that you have and clear up any issues that you may have. All right, we'll see you guys in the next recording.